Looking back at fond childhood memories is such a blissful way to get a surge of nostalgic happiness that takes you back to a better time. To many kids growing up in the early to mid 2000s with a certain sponge addiction, there's a nugget of joy locked deep within their hearts represented by the masterpiece of a 3D collectathon. But there's also another memory, a similar yet different one. However, this isn't any nugget of joy that takes you back. This is a memory that should have been kept stored away long ago in the past. If you had fond memories of playing through Battle for Bikini Bottom as a kid, well, there's a very good chance there's another SpongeBob game sparking in your thoughts that you can't quite recall. <laughs> Ew. The SpongeBob SquarePants movie, the game, is an interesting study case. It demonstrates the negative effects of a game that is restricted in its premise, with no proper structure to fully flush out the advantages of what a licensed title can produce, as well as the unfortunate necessary laziness of a rushed product, and how it brings the overall experience plummeting downwards to the depths of mediocrity. The movie game was released less than a year after Battle for Bikini Bottom, and I'm not a game developer myself, so I don't know the exact time frame a game like this needs to be in the oven to properly cook to the same excellent quality of battle, but there's many, many apparent problems that tell me it was in some capacity rushed to meet a deadline. Over the years, I've noticed that these two games are always clumped together it seems, and on the surface they do seem almost identical, but if we go past what we see at face value we get a disappointing realization that the movie game flounders in every single category that made Battle for Bikini Bottom amazing. Even as a kid I always knew Battle was the better game, but it honestly pisses me off that the overall recollection of the movie game from fans is... Yeah, it's okay. No. This game is in no way, shape, or form a worthy spiritual successor to Battle for Bikini Bottom, and I'm sadly here to tell you all about it. The first case of limited creativity stems from the very foundation of what the movie game is built from. I have to give this game a little leeway, because I will say that movie games in general have a tougher job conveying the key advantages licensed games have, since the material available is usually way less than the actual series, you know, assuming they even have one. In the case of Spongebob, Battle vs. the movie game is roughly three seasons of world and character building, versus an hour and a half film that leaves a majority of that world and characters behind. Huge disclaimer, I freaking love the first Spongebob movie. In fact, I hold it to be the best cartoon TV show to feature length film adaptation of all time. It's that good. But I would be lying if I did say that the movie gave a lot for the game to go off of because it, it didn't. I'm not too tight about the actual story of the game, which obviously had to be locked down to the major plot points of the movie, hence why it's called the movie game, wow, go figure. Stories and platformers are not a core concept that I care that much about. If it has something deep and meaningful, that's awesome. But if we're saving the princess for the tenth time, that's cool too. If I don't care about the story that much, then why am I talking about it? Well, the presentation of the game's story might be both the saddest and funniest thing I've seen all week. And I've seen the Ekam Bokum VTuber girl this week. That's totally not going to be dated by the time I finish this video. You pretty much get the Sparknotes version of the movie conveyed through these wonderful cutscenes, if you can even call it that, of just static images with narration filling you in on the broad details of the plot. And maybe some lines from the characters here and there, if you're lucky. You know all the funny bits and jokes from the movie? Yeah, sorry, they're not here. Any attempt at replicating a joke from the movie just comes across half-baked and unfunny, since the scenes jump across at a rapid pace, and the actual movie movie's genius visual comedy doesn't work out so well in static JPEG form. SpongeBob, wait! Break mine chocolate. You're telling me even Madagascar had a clip of the actual movie? I suppose ripping screenshots from the movie wasn't good enough because multiple times they use self-made images, where they stick generic art of the cast members to try and fit whatever scene they're dealing with. 
These are so horribly out of place looking that it's actually really funny, but in a sad way. Just look what's going on in this cutscene. You have Mr. Krabs, where he just shrinks out of nowhere, and he loses his arm for some reason. SpongeBob and Patrick just shrink while they're doing the same pose, getting hugged by Mindy. And look at SpongeBob's mouth. It's two shades of yellow. <laughs> I gotta say though, these cutscenes are getting me a little nostalgic with those 2007 YouTube Movie Maker transitions. It's just missing one little thing. Occasionally you'll get some in-game graphic cutscenes which just don't hold the same crusty charm as Battle for Bikini Bottoms. No jeez! Oh, this has never happened before! Bruh. But instead, just this nasty feeling that makes me want to look away from the screen. Bruh. Look at this dude. <laughs> This game coming directly after Battle for Bikini Bottom, while being the same genre and presumably being on a tight deadline, it is a no-brainer that the devs reuse content of the wazoo. Almost every key element from the previous game is turned into a more bland and generic asset in order to fit alongside the context of the movie better. SpongeBob's underwear is replaced by Krabby Patties as health. This may seem like a harmless change at first, but it's just the start of the game losing its creativity. For example, when you picked up a pair of Spongebob's undies, you'd get a remark from whatever character you're playing as in battle, but grabbing a Krabby Patty in the movie game just plays this stock sound effect. Shiny objects are replaced with uh, dumbbells and weights. I know a common theme of the movie is becoming a man, but I think this is such a literal application that it's making my head hurt. All of the cheekies are reskinned to these soulless plankton crates. You tell me which design oozes more personality. Almost all of the enemies share the same attacks as the robots, just 10 times more generic looking and annoying to fight. God, don't get me started on the enemies just yet. The charm on some of the moves in the game is just eviscerated. For some odd reason, Spongebob's bubble moves are replaced with actual objects that seem kinda comically out of place. Like Spongebob just whipping out a boxing glove or a bowling ball out of nowhere. To me, this is a huge missed opportunity, since in the movie itself, it was a reoccurring joke that he and Patrick were a pair of bubble-blowing babies. So why take them away and change it to something more bland? In fact, it could have been a funny joke if you started the game off with the bubble attacks and then transition to the actual objects when Spongebob becomes a man. <laughs> Sorry, that would have required a little bit of creative juice though. Lastly, the golden spatulas are replaced with goofy goober tokens. Honestly, these tokens feel fine as a secondary collectible, but as the main thingy to grab all throughout the game, it falls a little flat compared to the golden spatulas. All of these objects act as a collective group, and these new assets lost the charm and uniformity they once had in battle. As a collectathon, you will encounter these all across your adventure from beginning to end, and they're simply not as satisfying to collect or destroy. But hey, Hey, come on, let's look at the bigger picture at hand. What about the actual level design? It's still just as good as ever, right? Disappointment in the game of life! The movie game is yet again another 3D collectathon, so this is how it's blended in with Battle for Bikini Bottom in some people's minds. The same linear design with the platforming levels is kept, except now you'll be playing across locations that are incorporated from places Spongebob and Patrick went through in the actual movie. This is already a huge red flag since no offense to the movie, no really, I do actually love it, the areas were somewhat forgettable, at least compared to the places that have already well been established like Jellyfish Fields or Downtown Bikini Bottom. I mean, can you honestly remember that many distinct locations from the movie yourself? Now to its credit, I know this was the point, the movie is this huge quest for Neptune's crown set outside of Bikini Bottom to this dark and treacherous land. Visiting these places isn't an issue in the film since, for one, it didn't drag its feet in any one location for too long, and two, the movie is, uh, you know, funny, and not just a dry, isolated land heap of platforming. The movie game had a large task to flesh out these brief and relatively uninteresting areas, which I suppose you can tell from the lead up so far, it kinda didn't do that well at. Even after just playing it, I really have to sit down and think in order to distinguish out the six main platforming levels. Yeah, only six. How about that? 
These can be summed up as these continuous stretches of similar environments layered with many enemy rushes, random challenges, and the occasional meaningful platforming segment. What kept the worlds and battle fresh and exciting was the variety. Not only across the entire game, but even the scenery within the levels themselves were constantly changing to better keep the player excited and flesh out the world. The movie game attempts this from time to time, I guess, but it never feels like I'm exploring different parts of these areas. Instead, just one stale flavor. Even if the environments you traverse are a bit boring, it can be somewhat saved from them being fun and interesting to platform across. I think it's fair to say the individual objectives sprinkled across a level makes up the structure, since the level design has to accommodate for whatever task you're about to do. Remember how in battle there was a good mix between environment and NPC mission spatulas? Well, the movie game also follows a set of specific goober token types. First loading into a platforming level, you're usually greeted by Mindy, who tells you to either destroy something Plankton's using to control people, or just simply getting to the end of the level making your way closer to Shell City. Akin to battle, these main objectives take the entire level to complete. So what are the rest of the seven objectives all about? For starters, there's only six goober tokens instead of eight per platforming level. Except for I'm ready, depression for some odd reason, what is uniformity, eh? And uh, wait, hold on, let me see if I'm reading the script right. There's only two unique Goofy Goober tokens that happen within the confounds of the level itself. Let me say that again. Aside from the overall main Goober token mission, there's only two, two unique objectives to do across any given level. Having unique activities constantly pop up is something that keeps any good collectathon interesting. In Battle's case, there was a purpose for these objectives via character needs. It's a darn shame everyone in Bikini Bottom is being mind controlled, and one of Battle's best aspects is ditched in order to fit into the context of the movie. Seriously, the only character you ever talk to throughout the entire game is Mindy. I didn't make this video to roast Mindy fans, but every time she pads out the game, I mean requires more goofy goober tokens to teach us a new move, I really want to just turn the game off. It doesn't even make any sense, I mean she doesn't need these tokens to teach Patrick how to pick up and throw something. Mindy, there's people's lives on the line and you're out here playing games. It's even more of a shame because these few objectives tend to be the most fun tokens to snag. I can see a small glimmer of potential in the level design from time to time, but to make matters worse somehow, a lot of these tokens require the player to backtrack to them once they've gotten a specific move. Why? Why? Who needs Why? cohesiveness, right? Why? When you are already struggling to put in just a couple of fun things to do in your level, why in the world would you lock them away until later on in the game? Where at that point, these objectives feel so dislocated from the actual level. Speaking of feeling dislocated, this game is in dire need of more set pieces. Set pieces are used to give players a takeaway from what they just experienced to help stick that specific area in their mind well after they're done playing. Think of it as a distinguishing landmark of sorts. Try and recall some of your favorite levels and platformers, and whatever immediately comes to mind that you associate with that said level is probably one of its set pieces. In the movie game, aside from the levels being places we're not too familiar with, there's a severe lack of iconic platforming elements. Like in Now That We're Men, you can briefly ride across the acid and lava on this monster. Or look at this section where this random disco place comes out of nowhere. You see, this is both memorable and fun. These gave me an interesting segment of gameplay and something to remember the levels after I'm done with them. I'm often so shocked at these brief instances of joyful gameplay and creativeness that I think, hey, this game isn't complete booty, but too bad I'm quickly sucked right out of it by these wonderful designed and well worth my time challenges. So you're going through these platforming levels and you stumble upon this glowing pad of sorts. Going into one teleports you to a far away land, aka just the middle of nowhere. You've entered an epic challenge. The third category of goober tokens that make up half of the objectives you'll be doing in any given platforming level. Within these challenges, there are three main types, the sponge ball, floating block, and combat arenas. Didn't you love how 
awesomely well the Spongeball controlled in the last game? Well, here you have to make precise movements through these obstacle courses. Is it sad that these are the best challenges by far? Alright, Loki, these are not that bad at all, somewhat enjoyable even, but it's sad these couldn't have been implemented within the actual levels, which would have made both the specific challenges and the level itself more memorable. The floating block challenges really gave a chance for the devs to let loose and release all of their stocked up creative juices. That's been building up from the moment they got told to make a movie game. Just look at these excellent and well-crafted block placements. Truly exquisite design. And the combat arenas. You're dropped off on this large flat surface and get absolutely bombarded with a barrage of countless enemies. Uh, there is no strategy whatsoever. The only thing you can do is spam the B button while jumping around hoping you don't get hit too many times and have to start the entire thing over. I mean, they just keep coming and coming, 30, then 40, then 50. It blows my mind that someone got paid to sit down at the initial planning meeting for this game, bring this idea up, and everybody else was like, ah, okay, that sounds fine. Unlike the last two challenges, the combat arenas are more or less the same thing every time, except it just gets more and more annoying with each progressing level. I haven't even gone over how horrid the combat is, but just look at how ridiculous this is. Uh, just look at it! Hold up now, but Battle had enemy rushes too, right? What's the difference? I'm not calling Battle the Dark Souls of Spongebob games, but just take notice that every time an enemy rush happens in this game, and then compare it to these combat arena challenges. The unique environments alongside a wealthy moveset, and fun enemies to beat equals enemy rushes that are enjoyable, not this mind-numbing experience that destroys any available brain cells you still have after making get far enough to get to the last combat arena. Here it is. The ultimate challenge. There's two other challenges I should mention, these ring and bungee ones that appear every so often, pretty much the same stuff every time, but at least they have the decency to stay within the level itself. And it's neat to go around the areas in the ring challenges, regardless of how annoying it is. Don't be fooled though, I'm not idiot, and I take extra offense to devs putting in lazy and cheap gameplay tactics to fool kids into thinking that the game that they're playing isn't a heap of garbage. Aside from these challenges, as being an excuse to not design more of the actual level, it acts as a way to artificially pad out the runtime of the overall level to make it seem like it's longer than what it actually is. I was honestly a little shocked at how short they are. I mean, if you take out the combat arena challenge from the first main level, you're left with around 10 minutes of gameplay. To be fair, just having a short level isn't a gaming sin in itself, but my entire gripe with the level design is just how vacant and uninteresting it is. But hey, you know what, I'm still glad that we're just platforming the entire game, nothing else, right? So, you may have noticed throughout the video so far that I've been using the term platforming levels, but why am I being so specific? I mean, this is a triple A platformer after all. I guess Play Magazine forgot to mention this game is equal part platformer, equal part driving and sliding game. At first, these stages may seem like a nice little distraction or something to spice up the gameplay, until you realize that they make up the same amount of levels as the platforming stages do. Bruh. The driving sections have you making your way downtown in the paddy wagon. These aren't too bad when the course is one longer stretch of obstacle course, but there's some that just repeat the same smaller section with three laps and a few extra pathways added to make it feel like they're not desperately reusing content. The thing that really makes me roll my eyes every time one of these levels pops up on my screen is the paddy wagon's controls. It may seem alright at first, but the lack of any kind of drifting makes you hope 
hope and pray that you don't turn a corner too sharp and end up crashing into the wall. It feels like you're slipping and sliding all over the place with no sense of stability, but I suppose that's to be expected when you're driving a sandwich. As much as I want to roast at these levels, not even I can deny the catchiness of the music that plays during them. And yes, the same track plays each time. Which is alright, I mean, it's a really good song, except for the last driving stage, where you're rushing across this apocalyptic bikini bottom in order to save Mr. Krabs' life. It may just be me, but I don't think an upbeat country song fits the mood that well. The driving levels are home to one of the only times the game deviates heavily from the movie. After Spongebob and Patrick are captured by the Cyclops, they black out and awaken to Gooberland, this goofy goober amusement amusement park dream world. This area looks so imaginative. I just want to go out and explore it, but too bad it's regulated to a driving section. I'm sorry for expecting to platform in my triple A platformer. I'm fast as fuck, boy. The sliding levels may seem a bit more familiar to anyone who's played Battle, because you do, in fact, slide. These are far better than the driving sections, but they do tend to just drag on for so long. Oh, but you didn't complain about Battle's sliding segments at all in your last video. Well, yeah, I didn't because in Battle, the sliding segments are indeed segments. They acted as brief departures from the core gameplay of platforming, and I think the movie game missed that memo. Let me not be a total Debbie Downer. I mean, there's a few cool segments, like these flipping spiked platforms that don't stop turning until right before you have to jump. Like, whoa, which one is it going to be? You know, overall, pretty passable. Going through them only one singular time won't hurt anybody. Whoa, it's a good thing that you only have to play through these driving and sliding levels one time, not two times, not three times, not four times. Throughout the entire game, just one single time, and that's it, you're through with them. So, every driving and sliding level has four total goober tokens to get. One for playing through it the first time, of course. The other three, well, so I heard you like time challenges, so here's a time challenge harder than the first time challenge. I'm not playing around, there's two separate time challenges for every one of these levels. Mindy tries to cover the padding up by saying it's a macho time challenge. But even if you have already beaten that same time while doing the regular time challenge, it won't count for both. Because why would it? That would be less time spent playing the game and that's bad. And I'm having such a great time. You also have these ring challenges where you contemplate if you're playing the Spongebob movie game or Superman 64. Mess up a single time and you gotta do the whole thing over again. You know, with a laughable bare minimum of 50 goober tokens required to beat the game, you don't have to do every single one of these, but the times you are forced to do them just act as horrible pace breakers. The game moves along at such a brisk pace only to be roadblocked by Mindy telling you to get more goober tokens, booting you back to the pause menu signaling for you to get ready for some time and ring challenges. Take these along with most of the platforming level challenges, which already feel like a different kind of padding, and you're left with an empty shell of a game. It just makes the entire experience exhausting to play. At no point was I ever excited to move on to the next stage in fear that I would have to go back through some rings to progress. Or even worse, I could actually play through the platforming level to get smacked with a lovely combat arena challenge at some point. There is absolutely no joy waiting at the end of any of the loading screens whatsoever. And that's a big problem if you could guess. Sadly, the padding isn't even debatably the worst thing about the game. Okay, yeah, it might be, but this is pretty bad too. Remember how the robot force from the last game had so much variety and personality? Well, the enemies in the movie game said forget all about that, let's be as bland and forgettable as possible. A big reason for this is that they actually change aesthetic depending on which level you're in. The multiple styles just leave me scratching my head when trying to recall any specific designs for the enemies. I could tell you how disgusting they are though. I hope you enjoy large burps and projectile vomiting because you'll get plenty of that all throughout the 
the game. I do appreciate that they kept the little cutscenes introducing an enemy type for the first time, but you'll want to forget they ever existed very soon. Funnily enough, I can divide my issues with the combat and enemies into two parts reflecting the first and second halves of the game. If you've seen the movie or just look at the cover art, you would know your two playable characters, sorry Sandy fans, are Spongebob and Patrick. They are stripped down to the bare essentials at the start of the game, meaning you can do a neutral spinning attack and that's it. You do progressively acquire more abilities with Mindy teaching you one per level. But man, this really hinders the early game combat. With a severe lack of options, you're pretty much just going around spamming the B button over and over. You don't even get a satisfying sense of accomplishment from learning these new abilities. Because if you could tell by those air quotes, they don't feel all that new. What's this, Mindy? You want to teach me how to use the upwards bash attack? An ability SpongeBob had in his base moveset in battle? Gee, thanks. I think poor Patrick got gypped the hardest. He doesn't get taught how to pick up and throw things until his very last level. The ability that distinguished him the most from the other characters? Yeah, we'll toss it in at the very end, I guess. To the game's credit though, they did manage to squeeze in a single, actually new move, which is this cartwheeling attack for Patrick. Honestly, this kinda makes Patrick a lot more fun to play as compared to how he was in battle. I think that's the first good thing I've said about this game the entire video. How sad. Towards the end of the game, your arsenal of attacks starts to get beefed out some, with learning the cooler moves such as the bowling ball and cruise bubble, I mean, the sonic wave. It sure took the game long enough, but oh yeah, we got some cool abilities, let's go find some enemies. Oh no, bro. The devs got way out of hand with how annoying the enemies are in the second half of the game. You're pretty much going to be swamped with flingers, poppers, and mervs constantly. The sole reason I despise all of these abominations is just the utter lack of interaction. The flingers fly away if you stay too close to them, the poppers dip underground if you step within a couple of inches from them, and the mervs auto-lock onto you and shoot if you get anywhere even remotely near them. What's the point of having a diverse move set if you can't even use it against the enemies? The best way to combat these are just to stand around and wait for them to shoot their projectile at you and just reflect it back at them. Individually these enemies aren't too bad but they usually group all of these types together in the plentiful amount of enemy rushes. Keep in mind you're also trying to deal with the more fodder grounded enemies. If you can't tell from the gameplay this is just terrible because it constantly feels feels like you're getting sniped off screen and there's nothing you can do about it. All of this comes together into a fever pitch with the combat arena challenges, but we should all know how bad those are by now. I know some of you watching may think I'm over-exaggerating the awfulness of the combat for the sake of the video, and think it's not a big part of the game. Well, I can safely say that how terribly this game handles enemy placement will actually hinder any enjoyment you could be having in these levels. Enter Planktopolis. It's the last main level with a cool atmosphere that makes good usage of all of Spongebob's abilities. Sounds like a really solid experience that is ruined by the constant barrages of these annoying enemies. Just look at this, you gotta make your way to the middle while jumping across these sinking platforms just to be continuously shot by three different mervs. And you know what, just for the lols, let's add in some more projectile enemies from time to time. I'm happy that their bachelor degree in game design is really shining through. Oh yeah, the bosses, they also really suck. Uh, but I mean, that's kind of a problem most platformers have for some weird reason. They're always just too easy or boring to play, but I mean, that's a topic for another video. King Neptune, the final boss, is a little better than the rest, but come on, where's the goofy goober rock song? You're telling me that they had access to one of the best finale songs in cinema history and they chose not to use it. Video games are an art form, a complicated, layered piece of artistic programming that is made up of many different tiny bits and pieces that, when combined, make something that thousands of people will enjoy. 
Yes, this industry at the end of the day is here to make a profit out of what we describe as art. But no amount of cash can replace the legacy of a video game that manages to find its way into the hearts of anyone who chooses to let them in. The money made will eventually wither away, but a piece of art will remain constant forever. As much as I don't like the Spongebob movie game, I can't help but feel sorry for it. After coming off the heels of a title that has a piece of my metaphorical heart for the rest of time, it is disappointing to see how something so similar be created with a tragic case of limited creativity. I may have come off as overly harsh with my evaluations during the video, but I wish not to underplay how drastically this limitation impacted the entire experience. Experience. Playing through this game, it felt as though everything was forced onto the devs instead of them naturally planning out every detail through a common love of the show SpongeBob SquarePants. Something as silly as the plot of Battle for Bikini Bottom, where SpongeBob and Patrick wish upon the hopes that their toy robots will come alive, only for it to actually happen, but not quite in the way that they had wished for. This set up so many creative and cohesive elements throughout the game. The the enemies, the bosses, and the levels, everything felt like one big picture. The movie game has no sense of togetherness. It lacks any kind of aspect that will be kept fondly in your mind, instead of essentially being a piece of code used for money. Actually, throughout all of this, I have a newfound respect for the movie game. It shows me what can happen to anything if the decay of the world's demands lets it affect their core being. The decay of potential for the willingness to accept settlement for mediocrity. What we accept as passable today will be washed away tomorrow. Or maybe the devs just goofed and made a bad game. <laughs> There's gotta be at least a few things I really enjoyed during this romp through the Spongebob movie The Game. So you're asking me, is there anything good about this game? Uh, the Avatar teaser it has shows off the pilot footage. That's pretty cool. Mm, Spongebob and Patrick have different costumes depending on which level they're in. That was a cut concept from Battle for Bikini Bottom, so it's fun to see it made its way into this game. Mm, they added a self-center command to the camera that was strangely missing from battle. Also, the part where Plankton mimics Patrick as he flies away with the flag in between his cheeks was pretty funny. Who am I kidding? I wouldn't be doing the movie game any amount of justice if I didn't talk about the one thing it has over Battle for Bikini Bottom. The one element that keeps it from being one of the worst games I have ever played. Deep within the game's files, it has the SpongeBob second season commercial. SpongeBob SquarePants, SpongeBob SquarePants, second season, SpongeBob second season. Monkey, please shut the fuck up!